Welcome, climate viewers. This is Jim Lee with Facts Minus Fear Porn. It's November 11th, 2018. And uh, I'm going to give you a brief update on some of the stuff I'm working on. Um, I'm going to talk about ionospheric heaters, uh, artificial gravity waves, and chemtrails. The word, not anything else. So this is going to be a pretty funny update. Um, I've been trolling uh, Chris Fallen, the head science guy over at Harp on Twitter, and uh, <laughs> he he really got trolled today. So this is going to be kind of funny for you guys. All right. So um, what you're about to see is also free of charge, uh, open source, Creative Commons. Um, everything on climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, and weathermodificationhistory.com is free for you to use. I simply hope that you would uh, support my work at patreon.com slash climateviewer or give a one-time donation on PayPal or GoFundMe. It would be greatly appreciated. Um, but let's get right to it. So, yes, a uh, day or two ago, I did an article... Arecibo's ionospheric heater is boiling the tropical sky November 3rd through 9th, 2018. And for most people, all they know about ionospheric heaters is there's HARP. And HARP is the one that's in Alaska. And they, you know, some people know that there are ionospheric heaters around the world. Um, but they don't realize, you know, which ones they are. What's the difference between an ionospheric heater or an ELF um, facility? I get these kinds of emails all the time, especially about Exmouth in Australia. They're like, you don't have this harp on your map. And I'm like, that's a ELF station. But anyway, there's a difference between transmitting extremely low frequency waves and creating them with high frequency waves and using the ionosphere to do it. And that's what ionospheric heaters do. So, you know, of course, in this article, I, you know, dropped a couple of Chris Fallon's tweets along with, you know, some of the people that were listening into the signals from the Arecibo ionospheric heater. And, uh, of course, you can see the map um, down here near the bottom of what the Arecibo heater looks like um, and fly over to it on Climate Viewer 3D. Um, simply by clicking the link, it'll bring it up, um, you know, and fly you right to it just like that. So there's the Arecibo heater. And if you want to make it truly 3d, cause this is flat, um, you just go over here to base maps and turn on the terrain. So you do that. And then suddenly we have terrain and it's an actual 3d like so. Um, so this is the Arecibo heater we're talking about, and it's, uh, you know, obviously, um, ooh, why'd I do that? It's, uh, right at the equator, it's in Puerto Rico, and all the, in, you know, information on it's over here available on the sidebar, just click on the little icon. Um, and, you know, of course I tweeted some of this over to, I tweeted my article over to Chris Fallen from Harp. And uh, he kind of got a kick out of it, and he said, ionospheric boilers, so much more vivid than ionospheric heaters, even though both descriptions fall short of the physics. Um, I'm going to interview him at some point, I swear to God, and <laughs> we're going to debate that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, question mark, exclamation point. Somewhat mixed about the rest, but the video's bottom line, attack ideas, not people, is something we can all get behind. <laughs> Bravo, sir. Uh, I fully agree with that. That's why I say it. You know, this is all about attacking ideas, not people. Um, I do not believe that Chris Fallen is an evil genius up at um, the University of Alaska. Even though he may operate the Harp facility, that does not make him evil. And we can debate the facts all day long. So I thought that that was pretty epic response, you know, and I did, you know, for the record, you know, I did say Arecibo's ionospheric heater. So I did call it a heater and I said, it's boiling the sky, <laughs> but regardless, um, that's some epic trolling right there. Ionospheric boilers. Um, but anyway, 
So moving along, um, so a friend of mine, Weathered Hype on uh, at Weathered Hype on Twitter, you know, asked him a question about uh, you know some gravity waves that he saw on satellite, and he said, "What's your opinion on is called?" What's your opinion on what is causing the stationary wave pattern from moving clouds, lower atmosphere, not moving ones in the higher atmosphere as you see? And uh, Chris is like, those look like waves. I'm not a meteorologist. Um, and he's like, problem is these waves are stationary and the clouds move in and out. Um, that points to electromagnetic waves. And, um, of course, Chris Fallon's like, there's no problem with those waves being stationary, and it does not imply the use of electromagnetic waves to create and maintain them. So this is a point of contention that a lot of people have. Um, you know, everybody who sees, uh, you know, the rib bones in the sky, the evenly spaced uh, clouds, they immediately assume that they are, you know, created by EMF or electromagnetic frequencies. And that's not always the case. Their gravity waves can also be known as Lee waves. I'm Jim Lee, um, coincidence. Um, some of these can be created by uh, mountaintops. So as the air rises over the mountain, then it falls and then it goes, you know, like that and like that. And that'll cause these, you know, gravity wave um, looking clouds. Um, but that's that's not always the case. And I wanted to point that out to Chris. <laughs> um, you know, this probably didn't go over too well for him. And he says, what's causing them then? They're all over the place. He says, for example, Lee Wave, you know, from Wikipedia. And, you know, if you look at the Wikipedia page, it describes exactly what I showed you, as you can see right here. Um, that's a mountain wave, Lee wave. Um, but that's not the only thing that can happen. That's the typical response you get from any kind of weather guy or scientist. Oh, well, these are just naturally occurring. Um, and so I says to him, Chris, come on, bro. And then I quote this. Results of our ionospheric high frequency heating experiments to generate artificial acoustic gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances, which were conducted at, wait for it, the Harp facility in Gakona, Alaska. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so uh, I'm sure that that kind of came as a surprise to him. Here's the actual PDF. Generation of artificial acoustic gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances in high frequency heating experiments. And this was done at Harp. So either he's not well read or he's just obfuscating, but ionospheric heaters can create gravity waves. So there is a correlation between using electromagnetic frequency and creating gravity waves. But that's not all I said. So I went on to go, here's some more papers. Investigating the acoustic gravity waves created by anomalous heat sources, experiments, and theoretical analysis, and F2 region atmospheric gravity waves due to high-powered, high-frequency heating and subauroral polarization streams. Right there's the links for those. Uh, what, what, what's that? Uh, my link got cut short. Bah. Anyway, I'll fix that tweet. Shame, shame. Um, and then you can see it right there. And these are gravity waves due to high-powered, high-frequency heating. So they're called AGWs, artificial gravity waves. And you can see this one right here says right here, data comes from the Champ and Grace spacecraft overflying the, wait for it, high-frequency active auroral research program. So there's no way, and this is 2012, and I know that Chris Fallon is kind of new to the Hart facility. You know, he came in after 2015. I don't know, maybe he was there before then, but in 2015, the U.S. Air Force and Navy sold it to the University of Alaska. So maybe he doesn't know all this stuff. Um, but regardless, he's going to know it now because I'm going to send him this video as well. <laughs> Trolling. Um, but of course, 
we covered all of this, me and my bud Dominic Marama from Weather Modification History, in an article titled Artificial Gravity Waves, Barium Clouds, and Chemtrails from Space. And you can see that right here, um, Surfing Weatherman, James Wyland, number one jackass meteorologist, um, literally threatened people. All your IP addresses have been logged and given to the controllers. Have fun with your phone and computer glitches. Bye bye. I mean, literally, this is a meteorologist who's on TV, you know, making a joke about hacking people because. I whooped his ass on this exact same topic. So I sent him the same, you know, he was like, gravity waves are normal. And here's the four tweets that have the same references. I sent them to him. And of course, the very next thing he did was block me on Twitter. He's like, oh my God, I just got pwned. I better block this guy. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's pretty typical response because yeah, you know, these guys, you know, they, they got really big heads. They think because they got their degree in weather that they know it all. And they really don't read a lot, so they're not up on any of this stuff. And if they are, you know, there's the whole conspiracy that they've signed non-disclosure agreements and yada, yada, yada. No, they're just stupid. Um, so don't be surprised if you go arguing with a weather guy about ionospheric heaters or artificial gravity waves unless you're very technical like myself or have read my material and you know are good at referencing it then you'll be able to easily go over there and spank some weatherman ass like I do um, but you know of course all they do is run and retreat and put their whole in, head in the sand and block you so just wait for that but Chris Fallen you know he's been a, a good sport about all this um, and I expect that he will continue to be so that's what this video is about, you know, just kind of pointing out the fact that, hey, you know, you're over here on Twitter saying that, you know, this is just all natural, um, has nothing to do with, you know, electromagnetic frequency. Um, it's just a Lee wave. But, you know, when you've got paper after paper saying, hey, here's Harp, uh, you know, doing that sort of thing, um, the, the, there's really no, there's really no reason to argue about it, which brings me to my next point. I'm creating a PowerPoint presentation right now. I think you'll find it informative. So I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek of what I've been working on and it's called ionospheric heaters, space weather control and geophysical warfare. So this is my next big presentation, PowerPoint presentation. And I go through step by step, what is an ionospheric heater? Um, you know, it has to be between 2.8 and 10 megahertz, that sort of thing. Um, my map of ionospheric heaters, um, and then all of the other ELF and VLF facilities, ISCAT, incoherent scatter radars. Incoherent scatter radars and ionospheric heaters are one and the same thing. Um, you know, other incoherent scatter radars, super darn, Missile defense radar, radars like ballistic missile defense, ionosons, lasers and directed energy weapon sites, and ELF and VLF transmitters like the Exmouth one in Australia. It's the red dot there. Um, so, you know, what, this is the most important slide. This is what I'm going to cover in this presentation, and it's going to be freaking epic because I've been meaning to do something like this for the better part of two years. And uh, when I get done with this one, this is going to be one of the presentations for the ages. Um, I'm going to cover space weather control and how that affects weather on the ground and how it affects global temperatures, climate control. I'll cover extremely low frequency and ultra low frequency waves artificial gravity waves and traveling ionospheric disturbances mind control yes that's right mind control will be covered in this presentation with real references not that bullshit you normally find on youtube radiation belt remediation with artificial aurora creating artificial ionospheric mirrors to reflect radio signals and the laser developed atmospheric lens and how that can be used as a weapon as well as a spy tool 
Um, and finally, probing underground structures, which can lead to artificial earthquakes. So this is going to be a pretty epic presentation. Um, I can't wait to get it done. I'll give you guys a quick sneak preview. Um, but this is one that Dominic just found. Soviet superpower tests burned the ionosphere. But instead of creating a solid area of reflection, they discovered they were actually burning a hole in the ionosphere and the signal was being shot off into space. They made a five degree um, you know, signal that actually burned a hole in the ionosphere. They also noticed that in the area of the ionospheric hole had an effect on approaching weather fronts. The weather fronts were being deflected around the ionospheric heated area inadvertent weather modification there's that word again oh it's just an accident you know we just found out we accidentally controlled the weather with an ionospheric heater uh <laughs> it just goes on and on and then the russian woodpecker how 138 people in america died from free freezing how the el nino um popped up unexpectedly and off schedule in 82 and 83 and then how it was connected to the Chernobyl nuclear reactor and by 86 was detonated and shutting down the Russian woodpecker. Um, and the list goes on and on. There's going to be a whole lot in here. Uh, it's going to be very technical. I'm going to explain it in very simple terms. And there's the artificial gravity wave stuff, atmospheric gravity waves generated in the high latitude ionosphere. Each one of these will have references beneath it. So, you know, those links that I was trying to show you are right here. Um, I'm going to go through and make sure that everything is well referenced. So you'll be able to get those afterwards. So even the scientists can, you know, learn a thing or two about this. And, oh, mind control. Um, and snuffing out the Schumann resonance and a timeline of weather um, space weather control back from 1950 to present and into the future and i'm going to cover many different things in this section and it's going to look a lot like this so this is how far i've gotten so far it's going to be an absolutely epic ride i hope that you guys tune in um, for this so when you see the title of the video It'll be ionospheric heaters, space weather control, and geophysical warfare. Going to be a really, um, really nuts uh, presentation. I can barely wait to get it done, but it's taken me forever. So that's going to take a little while, but I left him with this. Lee waves and heart. <laughs> Basic experimental setup for the HARP artificial gravity wet, um artificial gravity wave experiments. We use a number of satellite and ground-based radio diagnostic instruments to detect the heater-generated artificial AGWTID. And that's straight from the PDF. Boom. So, um, I can't wait to see his response, but Mr. Fallen, you got pwned again. Damn, gotta suck. All right, so that uh, moves us on to the next topic. We covered artificial gravity waves. Chemtrails. Oh, the word chemtrails. My gosh. Um, this is going to be freaking nuts. Uh, all right. So let's be real blunt about this. You can call it whatever you want. But the words that you choose when talking about things like chemtrails are going to determine how people perceive what you're talking about. Now, what I see are chemtrails. Those are chemtrails. They are also contrails. They are also contrail induced cirrus. They are also cirrus clouds. So that's the main problem we have here. Now, I don't know if you know this chick, Dr. Naomi Wolf. Um, she seems to be, you know, pretty interested in the topic. I looked at her and, you know, says that she's a uh, CEO of DailyClout.io and written eight New York Times bestsellers about feminism and liberty. And suddenly she's got an interest in um, 
geoengineering and what and especially in chemtrails but for some reason every time somebody tweets something to her or i tweet something to her going look i know everything about the subject anything you like to know here's my phone number anything she has never responded to a single thing i say so that gives me caution i'm not going to click the follow button regardless david riddle says chemtrails and weathered hype once again big supporter love the guy chemtrails is problematic as a word because shills and liars out there use this for discrediting association it's a trigger oh i guess you're one of those flat earthers aren't you geoengineering climate engineering weather mod don't produce effects as much so if you use other terminology you're not going to get the same kind of response and uh he goes on to say that you know i want to validate you blah 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 netting uh said by the doctor she believes geoengineering but do, don't word it chemtrails but they are okay so this is where you know we kind of are splitting hairs um you know this is this is this is problematic okay so I think that he had said something else in here. Oh, it's a poopy. That's not supposed to be in there. That's not, oh, goodness. And this is what he said. No, not at all. It's only by observation. As Climate Viewer would put it, chemtrails is slave speak. Even though the military themselves have used it in some documents, it's a, the way it's being handled out there that turns into it into discredit observers and researchers. So really, using the word chemtrails is a great way to get yourself discredited right out the get-go. If you want to try to talk to somebody sanely about this, that's not the way to go. And the reason is simple. It's called slave speak. And slave speak is about high-level and low-level descriptors or mind control a field guide to language that maintains the master slave relationship slave speak and what you're going to realize is if you read this ideas are more powerful than guns we would not let our enemies have guns why should we let them have ideas language creates spooks that get into our heads and hypnotize us it is hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Or, as Carl Sagan would say it, one of the saddest lessons in history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we were, tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It is simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. So the problem with the word chemtrails is that it really does take power away from you. And it's going to put that power in the mind of the person that you're trying to influence. And the reason why is simple. Because there's a lot of crazy freaking people out there who say a lot of crazy freaking things about chemtrails. And, you know, I've heard it all in my seven years of research on this topic from the planes aren't even real, they're holograms, to they're, they're spraying smart dust robots, to this is all global depopulation to you know the list goes on but you know Edgar Allan Poe said believe nothing you hear and half of what you see okay and that's kind of important because your eyes can deceive you and you know what one person's chemtrail is another person's contrail. This is not, he's Edgar Allan Poe is not the first person to say this. Marcus Aurelius, everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is perspective, not the truth. 
So this is important to understand um, when you're talking about chemtrails is that, you know, that's not always the case. And flat earth is still full retard. Never go full retard. But <laughs> um, when we're talking about chemtrails, I just recently, my last presentation I did was called Carbon Black Dust and Soot, the Chemtrail Secret for Weather Warfare, Geoengineering, and Ozone Destruction. And as you can see, it's many slides, many, 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 many slides. This is going to be similar to what I'm doing with the HARP, um, you know, presentation. Facts. Nothing but facts, 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 facts. And you can learn all about how carbon black dust is being used by the military. How it's being used in uh, doing hurricane control. And I mean, this is straight from the military. Weather modification using carbon black. Increase cirrus cloud cover. So, if you want to call it a chemtrail... It is a chemtrail. It's a chemical trail of metals and carbon black dust and soot. Um, but what do you end up with? You end up with a cirrus cloud. And why do they say they want to make cirrus clouds? To deny visual satellite or high altitude reconnaissance to decrease light level for nighttime operations. That's straight from the military. That ain't my words. That's Dr. Arnold, Dr. Arnold Barnes from the Phillips lab at the Air Force Research Lab. Okay, military use of creating clouds. And, you know, you can't argue with this stuff. Using soot to steer hurricanes. Um, but, that doesn't matter. Because I use the word chemtrail in the title, what happens? I go and I put it up, you know, make a video, make a PowerPoint presentation, put it on YouTube, and, oh, there's the censorship, guys. He said chemtrail. We're going to correct that by in link linking to the Encyclopedia Britannica on contrail. So if you guys haven't seen these new fake news, um, you know, handlers that they're doing, that's what they look like now. They'll automatically see a word, go, that word is not real, and then put, you know, their propaganda page underneath so you know you can come over here and of course it'll just say it's condensation trail it's vapor trail it's just water and the 1990s popular conspiracy theory arose claiming long-lasting contrails contain chemicals they do can't contain, <laughs> contain chemicals oh my god it drives me insane um, and that, that's what's so stupid about all this. You know, they do contain chem chemicals. Here are the chemicals. Aluminum, barium, calcium, chromium, copper, iron, lead, magnesium, manganese, nickel, niobium, um, potassium, scandium, selenium, strontium, sulfur, tin, titanium, vanadium, zirconium. Are those not chemicals? <laughs> so it's, it's plain, it's plain stupidity and slave speak and word control and perception management. So they, they contain chemtrails that were sprayed by governments for the purposes such as controlling the weather. They do control the weather. They do alter the weather or dispersing drugs to influence the general population. However, atmospheric scientists have explained that some contrails last longer than others because of factors such as humidity in the air and temperature of the airplane's exhaust. So the high bypass um, planes, yes, they make more clouds than the older style planes, but that that's still obfuscating that it contains chemicals. It does contain chemicals. Um, it just it's it's insanity. So this is all a word game at this point. So even on my um my chemtrail page. It, I changed it from climateviewer.com slash chemtrails to climateviewer.com slash cirrus clouds matter. And I'm very blunt about this and it really pisses off the chemtrail debunkers. So I'm going to make it really large. If you remove all the slave speak from the debate, chemtrails and contrails are both terms referring to clouds 
made by jet aircraft. I choose to use the word contrail while talking to scientists because using the word chemtrail may cause them to discount the value of my words. I choose to use the term chemtrail while engaging with the public because using the word contrail tends to get you labeled as a debunker and may cause them to discount the value of my words. Both chemtrails and contrails are high-level descriptors, meaning they, have high, they are highly argumentative and have different meanings based on the individual. However, the term chemtrail and contrail are not alone. So if you actually go through Google Scholar and you read all the scientific reports out there, you will come to realize that geoengineering and homo mutatis and uh, aviation, uh, the, what is it, cirrus aviaticus, I mean, they've got all these damn terms for these clouds. But regardless, persistent contrails, spreading contrails, contrail cirrus, contrail-induced cirrus, which is the most widely accepted by um, you know, the scientists I've spoken to, contrail-induced cloudiness, aviation-induced cloudiness, AIC, aviation-induced cirrus, Induced cirrus cloudiness. I should have put an article type, you know, count on Google Scholar next to each of these, just so you could see how often they're used. Um, and now let's be redneck about it. Man-made clouds. And now let's remove all the slave speak from it. Artificial clouds. The term artificial cloud is most accurate term as it cannot be argued with and is the lowest level descriptor. So, at the end of the day, the entire chemtrail conspiracy boils down to one thing, intent. So, you can argue to your blue in the face about intent. And unless you find some smoking gun evidence paper, which in seven years I have not. I've seen many papers about using aircraft exhaust and using soot and using metals from planes to alter hurricanes, to alter weather, to change the temperature of the planet. They're using biofuels right now for contrail control. Uh, they're using biofuels to try to make less warming, more cooling contrails that make cirrus clouds. They're using cirrus cloud thinning to thin out what we call chemtrails so that they don't trap heat at night. Um, all of this is going on, but nobody can talk about it because they're what? Using the word chemtrails or they're using the word geoengineering. And even though Chuck Long from NASA has admitted that this is geoengineering, they call it accidental geoengineering. So there's a difference between what they call inadvertent weather modification or accidental geoengineering and the geoengineering that David Keith is trying to get legalized on a worldwide basis. So if you call it geoengineering, then they just look at you and say, that's not happening. That hasn't happened yet. We're trying to make that legal. They're doing field experiments, yada, yada, yada. Every bit of this boils down to word control. And until you learn that, you're really not gonna get anywhere. So for me, Chemtrails is a catch-all for many things, and I've covered this in my article, 10 Technologies to Own the Weather Today, and I made this infographic to sum it up. But chemtrails come from sounding rockets. They release chemical trails of trimethyl aluminum, barium, strontium, sulfur hexafluoride, and even lithium. And, you know, there was recently a video, you know, a couple years ago, lady calls up um, NASA, is talking to a scientist, and even the NASA guy is like, yeah, we use chemtrails all the time. Um, we use them to measure upper atmospheric winds. So, it, depending on the scientist you're talking to, they may speak more loosely using the term chemtrails, but that's exactly what chemical trail is. It's a trail of chemicals. 
And for me, it's that simple. It's, I don't believe, you know, I don't get into the straw man argument about it's to, you know, put drugs into people or nanobots or, you know, any of that bullshit. Um, when I say chemtrail, I am usually referring to cirrus clouds. And sometimes I'm referring to chemtrails from space, which are sounding rocket experiments, and satellites doing the exact same thing. Spraying aluminum, barium, strontium, trimethyl aluminum, um, things like that. And those are heated by ionospheric mirrors and ground based radars and can create noctilucent clouds. So there are many forms of chemtrails. They're, they are chemical trails, but the word chemtrail has so much negative con um, connotations that many people will assume you're a crackpot, say, put your freaking, um, you know, tinfoil hat on, and Google will correct you by putting a link to Contrail underneath your video. Because uh, God forbid people think that a chemtrail is true. Um, it, it, and, and what's even more ironic about it is, this video is loaded with nothing but scientific references from my PowerPoint that specifically go, look, this is the real version of the story. I've also done a video called Aluminum, Barium, and Chemtrails from Space. Oh, look, there's the exact same thing. So if you use that word chemtrail, you're going to get a no-no from the freaking uh, YouTube police trying to correct you. Facebook is talking about doing the same thing with their fake news filters and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to defeat all of this, the simplest term you can use is cirrus clouds. Because no matter what you want to say about the agenda, once a chemtrail or a contrail fans out and spreads out and covers the sky, the cloud that is left behind is a cirrus cloud. And that is why cirrus clouds matter. So I hope that this has been informative. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope you're looking forward to my ionospheric um, heater presentation because damn, I know I am and I'll be glad when it's over with because I've been working on this thing three days now. Oh my goodness. Um, so I've got a lot more work to do to it, but I'm going to try to make this the most all-inclusive one video for the ages, one presentation that says it all, explains it in layman's terms, and helps you to understand the big picture of all of the realms of possibilities of what can be done with an ionospheric heater like HARP. Because there's a lot, you know, just like with the chemtrail thing, there's a lot of claims out there and nobody has any facts to back up what they're saying. Well, I'm gonna bring you the best references possible to back up those statements, like the one you just saw earlier um, you know, the other one is from popular communications, like po popular mechanics, um, you know, notable, reputable sources. And this should nail that, nail it home for a lot of people. So, um, I hope that you guys will stick around for that. That'll be the, probably the next video I make. I'm going to work on that presentation until I get it done and I can't wait to do it. And uh, I hope that you guys will continue to support me um, on patreon.com slash climate viewer or give a one-time donation on PayPal or GoFundMe. Uh, I do appreciate everybody who has supported me so far. Uh, I, I get by with a little help from my friends. So there you go. Ionospheric heaters, uh, artificial gravity waves, and chemtrails, the high-level descriptor slave speak word of the day. Um, start calling them cirrus clouds and watch, watch, watch the change in tone. If you call any FAA person, if you talk to any meteorologist and you just simply say, I'm sick and tired of planes making cirrus clouds, watch the different response you get. It'll be completely different. If you call it geoengineering, they're going to say, that's not a thing. If you call it chemtrails, they're going to say, that's not a thing. And that's because in their little brains, they have been preconditioned to believe that chemtrails means this. It means 
global depopulation. It means Morgellons. It means smart dust. Every crazy crackpot theory out there that has no scientific basis, no evidence to back it up. Um, I mean, unless you can show me a rain sample uh, that has little smart robots in it, or, you know, and even then, you, that's not evidence because you can't prove that that rain in that jar came from that plane. So you guys got to understand, chemtrail, that's a no-fly zone. Geoengineering, once again, no-fly zone. They're going to say not happening, hasn't happened yet. David Keith and Scopex and you know, all of the different ocean iron fertilization. These are projects they're talking about in the future, trying to make them legal. This is not geoengineering. What planes are doing is accidental geoengineering. What ship tracks are doing is accidental geoengineering. So they're going to play their word games and you've got to be better at it than them. This is Scrabble people. So you use your words wisely. Um, and use this information wisely because information is powerful and with great power comes great responsibility. So I simply and humbly ask you to use this information to attack ideas, not people.